to come on board and provide some background information about what they do um, and also to answer questions as they stream in from uh, YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and the other social media applications. The reason why I wanted to do this cooking demo of Save the Tuna Seaweed Salad, uh, which is a recipe from my girlfriend, Terry DeSelke, who is also a seaweed harvester along the Mendocino coast. Um, and she, her website is seaweedmermaid.com. Um, is, this is a recipe that she has traditionally and historically served at the Mendocino Cancer Center fundraiser for over a decade. And it was so popular because it's vegan, it's kosher, it's halal, it's healthy, um, it's vegetarian. So this is something that you can serve anywhere with anyone, um, as far as I'm concerned. So um, I'm going to do the first step. Um, I'll read the ingredients and then I'm going to combine some of them and put them on the stove to cook for 10 minutes. And then um, while it's cooking, I'm gonna turn it over to James and Kari um, and have them talk for a little bit. So uh, for those of you who um, do not yet have the recipe for the Save the Tuna seaweed salad, it is one and a half cups of cooked chickpeas or basically one can, right? You can get the dried stuff and cook it, but a lot easier just to buy a can. Um, one quarter, ounce of kombu, so Laminaria species, um, cut into little tiny one quarter to one half inch pieces, um, four tablespoons of veginase or any other mayo that you have on hand, whatever you prefer, um, a half cup of dill pickle minced, want to make it easy like me? Get relish. Um, a half cup of celery, if you're into celery, I personally am not, so my recipe doesn't have celery in it. Um, three tablespoons of green onion that are already chopped. Um, one tablespoon of tamari sauce, or again, whatever sea, um, soy sauce you have. One tablespoon of bull kelp powder. And um, just so that you can see what dried bull kelp looks like, I have some here. And I'm sure James and Kari can tell you more about bull kelp, but Here's what it looks like, um, dried and it's hella tasty. Mm, my favorite. And then um, one tablespoon of nutritional yeast. Again, if there are other spices that you would normally put inside a salad, go for it. I'm a very loose and easy cook. I don't use measuring cups very often um, and everything seems to turn out okay. All right, so I'm gonna be adding the chopped up kombu that I chopped up earlier with a pair of handy shears. If you do not have kitchen shears, I'm talking to you guys, get a pair. They're awesome. So much easier than that. So I'm gonna add this kombu to the chickpeas in the water. And I'm gonna cook it in a pot for 10 minutes. And while I'm doing that, let's hear from James and Kari. So James and Kari, tell us how you harvest seaweed. Where do you get your whole kit from? Yep. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're cooking with Dr. Janine Pfeiffer right now um, from her Oakland kitchen. Um, she's getting us started with um, a really tasty dish and a really inspired her friend Terry DeSelke. Um, and uh, yeah, Janine works um, along the coast of California with harvesters throughout the state and is not a seaweed expert, but does know quite a bit about seaweed, I must say. Um, but is, is an enthusiast and um, a wonderful chef, as we're finding out. So Janine, back, back to you. All right, so just a reminder, I took the... Um, chickpeas, just the whole can, dumped it in along with the kombu, and I'm now putting it on the stove for 10 minutes. And while that is happening, and I have my timer, I'm gonna, oh, how much water? So I just used what was in the can. I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> um, if you were 
preparing the chickpeas on your own. So if you were more of um, a from scratch purist, which more power to you, which is one and a half cups of cooked chickpeas, you would um, cook those chickpeas and then drain the water until the cooked peas are loosely covered with water and then conserve that. Okay. Um, over to you, James and Kari. Tell us about harvesting bull kelp and kombu, if you do that as well. Tell us about what you do. Okay, well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm uh, happy to be here. And uh, well, uh, we've been uh, harvesting seaweeds on the Northern California and Southern Oregon coast for like 30 years. And uh, so when we, when we go out to harvest uh, bull kelp, uh, I'm out at the coast with a team of uh, helpers and we get out uh, way early in the morning when the tide is out and uh, we're out with these uh, uh, the, uh, kayaks out on the ocean and uh, we're harvesting these uh, bull kelp plants, usually, you know, up to a quarter of a half mile offshore, wherever that happens to be growing that year. And so we're out there in our kayaks and we're, uh, like grabbing these bull kelp bulbs and hauling them into the boat and, uh, and then cutting the, the fronds off maybe about a foot away from the bulb. And that gives us maybe, oh, 10, 15 feet of fronds to uh, try to wrestle into a burlap sack uh, while we're out there. And when we have uh, a full boat load, which usually takes, you know, uh, several hours of harvesting, uh, we head back in and uh, start hauling it back up to somewhere where there is a, uh, uh, the, someone's going to meet us with a pickup truck and we uh, get it all packed up and send it back to our, uh, to where we live inland and uh, um, where, uh, where Cotty and uh, her drying team of people are going to hang it all up and to dry in the sun uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, pretty interesting and pretty fun, and just there's just nothing like being out there in the inner tidal or out on the ocean at dawn, and and uh, out there in the elements and with all the all the life everywhere around you. And uh, um, so so anyway, yeah. So we're uh, we, we go out there and camp for several days at a time and send a load of seaweed home every day like that. Uh, when we harvest it like that, harvesting it uh, to cut the fronds out away from the bulb like that, the plant, each plant gets to continue to grow and, uh, and, and reproduce. Uh, so, um, so, you know, we, we do it in a way that we're taking a maximum of like a one out of four plants. Usually it's like one out of a hundred or less than that. But anyway, uh, so that there's no real impact to the, to the kelp beds and all the other things that live there. So anyway, then we send the, the, the load of seaweed home and uh, uh, Kari and the drying team uh, take care of the rest. And uh, so anyway, that's that part. Uh, with the kombu, we're, uh, we're taking the kayaks to somewhere where we can park them. And then we're going out on, on foot in our wetsuits and everything. And uh, we're cutting those in a way, again, uh, that, that allows each each plant to continue to grow and reproduce, cutting it a certain length out from where the, uh, where, it, where, where each blade is growing. Um, and again, same way, then we load up the kayaks and we paddle back to wherever the, 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 the vehicle is going to pick it up and, uh, and send a load home where, uh, Cotty was waiting with the drying crew. She could tell you about the rest of that. Hi everyone. Glad to be here too. We're so grateful that we get to work with this wonderful seaweeds, nourishing food, healing foods. And yeah, when the seaweeds come home, the, it's a good feeling the ocean's coming home to us here inland. We have a um, really dry climate here, so it dries very quickly. We have a crew of 12, 15 people or so to help us hang it up in the evening. Uh, we work with the youth in our area a lot. And uh, for many kids, it's their first job. And they come back year after year. The next, uh, by the evening, it's all hung up on long clotheslines. And by the next morning, it starts drying very quick. And um, around noontime, it's usually all dry, most of it dry. And then we'll take it down the late afternoon. And then we get another load coming home. And we do it all over again. 
And we use the seaweed in food for a lot of different things. It can be used in delicious dishes like Janine is uh, uh, making right now, in, in uh, baked goods, on popcorn, in soups, um, marinades. The options are endless. Um, yeah, so uh, all for now. We have more James. We have a question actually from the audience, uh, if, if we can do that really quickly. Um, so someone would like to know if uh, the bull kelp and, and the other kelp that you harvest, does it, is it regularly in the same spot every season or does it kind of move around? Do you, do you follow it around the coast um, to harvest or is it kind of always there? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So, okay, so with the bull kelp, that's an annual species. So it, 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 it always is moving around. It's always growing, uh, you know, maybe it'll be a thick patch for a few years and then it'll, it'll, for whatever reason, it'll stop growing there and it'll be in another place. It's, it moves around a lot. And uh, uh, whereas on the other side, on the other hand, uh, kombu is a long lived perennial species. It can live 10 to 15 years, each plant. And so all the places where that grows, it's pretty much there year after year after year. Great, thank you for elaborating on that. I think um, it's, it's challenging to know what kinds of seaweeds have what life histories, but once, once we do, we can start to pinpoint when and where we can find them. Um, and uh, we have another question on, on the baked goods, uh, Cotty, that, that you were mentioning. Very curious about, about those, if you can elaborate a bit more. Hey, I'm just going to check in while we're having this conversation. Um, a note that you need to keep an eye on your uh, not quite boiling, just sort of simmering um, chickpea and kombu combination. Uh, it is 222 seconds to go. And if I could have the video on, I can show everyone how um, the chickpea and the kombu are starting to soften. Because when I first put the kombu in, since it was dried, um, it was very brittle. Um, and I had kind of shown you, I sprinkled it down. So again, if you could put the camera on me, I can show y'all what's going on. Um, um, okay. Let's see. So if you look, I'll try and hold this up really close. The kombu is starting to soften and that's what you want um, in your seaweed salad. You, when the kombu is dried, um, it's, it is really brittle. It has kind of sharp edges, um, but as it cooks, and again, we don't want to overcook it. We don't want to undercook it. Um, it then becomes much more pliable Again, I'll show you this. See how it's it's more pliable and opaque. It smells great. I know we've got people cooking along on the other side. All right, back to James and Kari, and then um, in another two minutes we can poke back to me. Thanks. Talk about baking. Yeah, <clears throat> want to hear about the the baked goods? Um, traditionally, nori, especially, has been used in bread a lot in uh, in Europe, England. Um, all the seaweeds are, are good in, in uh, baked goods, especially if they're powdered. It's, uh, they, they help with the holding the dough together, especially if one um, cooks gluten-free. It really helps pro provide a gel that, that helps hold it together and well. And it adds the, the salty taste, the umami taste. It's really good in baked uh, uh, in, in cakes and sweets, sweet baking as well. Try it in your favorite cakes, in uh, raspberry bars or yeah, in cookies, whatever you like to, to bake. It add, really adds to the flavor. That sounds amazing. I'm getting very, very, very hungry right now. Um, and and where, um, how do you provide these, all of these goods and all of these, um, seaweeds that you preserve, 
how, how are those available for folks that are interested in, in getting them? Oh, go. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, basically, we have a mail order business, uh, Nature Spirit Herbs. And so, uh, naturespiritherbs.com. Uh, that's, you know, we, we, we try to su uh, get a supply during the growing season, uh, you know, uh, June, July, and August, and then have enough so that we don't run out uh, until next harvest season. Uh, so basically, people order online or call, and then we ship it out. Great. I, that brings me to another question about shelf life and stability. Um, does that vary for, for the different seaweeds or um, do, you, do you have an idea of how long I can keep um, preserved pack, um, dried seaweeds um, in my pantry? Uh, sure. Well, seaweeds are kind of like crackers, you know, they don't ever really go bad, but they can get stale over the years um, and they can get less crispy. Um, so basically if you're wanting to have like the, the snackable seaweeds and you need to re-crisp them, you can put them in the oven and just the lowest possible heat for some hours and they'll get crispy again. Uh, but basically if you keep them in a really airtight jar or double plastic bags, that sort of thing, and keep them away from light and moisture, uh, they, they pretty much keep indefinitely, you know, they don't really go bad, but, they don't improve with age either. I would say, you know, I mean, I mean, a, a year or two is still, they're still fine. So that gives you an idea. That helps a lot. Thank you. And Janine, let's pop back over to, to what's going on in your pot. <clears throat> so we have cooked our already cooked chickpeas or our can of chickpeas um, for 10 minutes together with the kombu. Um, I'm waiting to be spotlit. Um, and what you want to do after you have cooked your um, already softened chickpeas and your brittle kombu for 10 minutes in the water that was already in the can or that you had conserved from when you cooked your raw chickpeas. Um, you then wanna drain it, but drain very carefully because um, if you don't have the drain with really uh, tight uh, seal, you will lose some of your seaweed. So I drained it and now I'm going to put it in the bowl. And the next step is to mash the chickpeas. And I'm just doing it with a wooden spoon. Um, again, none of this has to be perfect. None of this is rocket science. Um, but the idea is to, to give it um, a softer texture um, so that when you mix the other ingredients in, it looks a little bit more like um, a chickpea mash and less like individual chickpeas. So after you have gotten those chickpeas into a really nice mash, you add the rest of your ingredients, um, which is the veginase or the mayo. And again, it's four tablespoons. So one, two, three, four, uh, and the pickles, um, a reminder for the recipe, it is one half cup dill pickle. Now, if you're not super into dill pickles, you can make it less than half a cup and um, maybe instead substitute a vinegar, like a rice vinegar, um, which is a sort of sweet vinegar. And I'm using sweet, re sweet relish because I like sweet relish better in this combination, but you can also do dill pickles or you can chop up um, butter pickles. I'm also adding in the green onion. Um, for the green onion, uh, the recipes of three tablespoons, I kind of like, love onion. So I'm putting in more like four to five tablespoons. You can also add a half cup of celery if you are into celery. And then um, just a dash of the soy sauce. You don't want to overwhelm the flavor. 
again, whatever soy sauce you have on hand. And then um, we are putting in an entire ounce of bulk kelp powder. Um, James and Kari, you sell bulk kelp powder too, don't you? We do. We don't currently have it on our website, but if you call us, we'll get it to you. <laughs> It'll be on there soon. Real soon. You can, you can make it happen. All right. So the, um, the bulk kelp powder that I'm using is from um, the Ocean Harvest Sea Vegetable Company run by Terry Vasilke. Website is www.seaweedmarinmade.com. And then um, I'm throwing in a very healthy tablespoon of nutritional yeast. And I know for some of us, we don't get enough nutritional yeast, like me. And so this is a great recipe um, to have that nutritional yeast in. Now, all you need to do is just stir everything up really well. You can serve it hot or cold. Um, Terry recommends that you do let it sit for at least half an hour um, so that all the flavors can mingle, just like you would you know, with any sort of like a chicken salad or a tuna salad or a quinoa salad, right? You like to let it sit for a little while. Um, and like I said at the very beginning, this is the kind of recipe that is vegan, kosher, halal, vegetarian. Um, it can be completely made completely organic. Um, it has two different types of seaweed, so it's incredibly healthy. And um, I would highly recommend it as something that you bring to safe, socially distanced potlucks <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Okay, um, in a moment, I'm going to show you what this looks like. It's a beautiful color. Um, all the different greens. You can see that. See how lovely it is? It's just, it's a really good looking salad. Um, and I'm going to do the taste test. This is really good. Um, I can, what I like is I can taste all the different flavors. I can taste the bull kelp, I can taste the kombu. I've got the chickpea. Um, everything's coming up in my mouth at the same time. So there you have it, the Save the Tuna Seaweed Salad. And we had a number of folks who actually purchased Cook Along Cooking Kits. And after this broadcast, um, they're all gonna get free copies of our seaweed um, cookbook. So I'm gonna, send it over to James and Kari to uh, round things out. Are there any other questions that folks had for James and Kari? Yeah, there, there are a few coming in. Um, if folks are not able to purchase the, the cook along kit, but they're interested in making this recipe later, um, how would you recommend that they get these ingredients? Uh, yeah. Um. You can order from us or you can order from Terry's uh, Ocean Harvest uh, Company. Yeah, just give her a call or order online from her or us. We both have uh, bull kelp and kombu for sale. That looks so good. And I really like the play on words, Janine, with the Saves the Tuna salad. Um, I think folks that are interested in eating seaweed uh, are really also interested in shifting kind of where we eat on the trophic level and eating lower on the food chain. So I'm, I'm definitely supportive of that. And it's, it's, it's one of those meals that you could prep and then take on your, you know, a day's hike and it just gets better over a couple hours. So I'm excited to try that myself. Um, there's also another question that, um, that you might be able to answer, uh, James and Kari about, um, folks that, uh, want to know about regulations that have to be met before harvesting or if there are certain precautions to take if, if people want to go out and harvest. Okay. Um, well, basically, uh, in, in California, you're allowed to harvest 10 pounds a day of fresh seaweeds uh, with the exception of sea palm. That's, that's the only one that, that they, they only are limiting to commercial harvest because you have to be really careful how to harvest it. Um, uh, but basically, uh, you uh, get a tide table 
and uh, flying out, uh, you know, basically, you know, May, June, July, August, uh, get a uh, um, tide table, find out some areas that are uh, exposed, like rocky intertidal areas exposed at low tide. Uh, the Northern California coast is pretty, pretty, pretty clean, but I'd be careful about harvesting too close to the large cities, uh, just to be cautious. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, rivers coming in from large agricultural areas. But other than that, uh, we got a pretty, pretty clean ocean out there. Uh, so you get out there at uh, find out when the low tide is. So if it's at, say, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock a.m., you'd want to get there a couple hours earlier so you can follow the tide as it goes out, get around out there, and then follow it as it comes back in because it goes up and down like eight feet. Uh, when the tides are really low, um, they go up and down a lot. And uh, don't leave your uh, don't leave anything out of sight uh, while you're harvesting because it might not be there when you come back <laughs> when the tide's coming up. And uh, uh, as far as uh, harvesting, uh, if you go to my website, I have a, a, a outline of uh, sustainable harvest methods, how to cut each kind. Uh, you know, at our website. Uh, on, under our harvesting info, uh, just just uh, uh, and then as a rule, just taking uh, maybe a maximum of twenty five percent of the of what lives there because well you uh, there's a lot of other things that live there too and depend on the seaweed for cover uh, and then basically you want to keep the seaweeds cool you want to harvest them keep them clean free of sand keep them cool and then get them started drying out well hopefully. Uh, you know, we usually harvest in the morning, we get it all hung up and it dries the next day. And you want to dry it fast. You know, if it dries within a 24 hour period, that's, that's really good. If you can get it within a, within one day, that's even better. Uh, you can dry it indoors if, you know, small amounts with a fan and some ventilation. Uh, outdoors, if you have a sunny, uh, dry day, it, it usually dries in in one, you know, from, from morning to evening, it's, or afternoon, it's dry. Start small, it's more work than you think. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, I, it is yeah. a big hearing all of that. And uh, it looks like we have someone, Deborah, who is by the Channel Islands. I myself am in San Diego. And so um, harvesting uh, in the wild can be kind of precarious. As you said, James, uh, we're near, you know, several outfalls, we have, different kinds of, of pollutants that we're exposed to along the Southern California coast, especially. But if, if ever anyone who's watching is able to get um, north of San Francisco to, to harvest, I mean, it's an unreal experience. A low tide in Mendocino or Sonoma coast is magical. So it's gotta be on your list to do it at some point. Um, yep. And again, I would encourage everyone to, um, who's watching this to specifically reach out to James and Kari at naturespiritherbs.com or to reach out to Terry Duselke at seaweedmermaid.com. Um, you can contact them via their website. You can give them a call. Um, I, I would really, really encourage that person to person contact because there's only so much that we can cover in a super short video. And um, the sea is not peaceful. It's the Pacific Ocean, but the Pacific Ocean is not peaceful. It's really, really, really precarious. And I, I think that we can't overstate the importance of being exceptionally careful and always going with a buddy when you harvest. Mm -hmm. Do not harvest alone, people. We want you to live to see another day. And then um, it, it should probably go without saying, but we don't harvest seaweed that has washed up on the beach, okay? That is dead, stinky seaweed. This is not what we're harvesting. We're actually harvesting um, living plants that need to be harvested in such a way that they can reproduce uh, for the years to come. So um, thank you again to everyone at California Seaweeds. Thanks to Leslie. Um, thanks to Dr. Janet Kubler who organized the festival. And uh, thanks so much to um, James and Kari for backing me up with their expertise. Thanks for asking.
Thanks so much, guys. That was really fun to take along with you. I don't know if we have. Okay, really quickly before before we leave, um, I just would like to go over some announcements so that I can prepare you all for um, tomorrow's portion of the California Seaweed Festival. Before I want, I want to thank all of our panelists today who were wonderful to have on. Um, we learned so much about seaweed as food, so thank you all. And um, remember that uh, Monday through Friday, we are doing screening of videos starting at noon and then 4 p.m. On the weekdays is when the live action starts 3 p.m. on Saturday. Um, so if you missed any part of the video screening today, we join us on the live stream archive uh, on YouTube for the California Seaweed Festival. It's on our channel. Okay, really quickly before, before we leave, um, I just would like to go over some announcements so that I can prepare you all for uh, tomorrow's portion of the... Thank you.